Hello, everybody. It's time for our Friday Q&A show hangout with your favorite art professor. Art Prof is a global community for learning visual arts. And if you would like to grow as an artist and you can't take an art class, we've got everything you need here at Art Prof. Critiques, tutorials, professional development, and workshops. Tell me in the chat, how was your week as an artist? Any updates on fun, shiny art supplies? Maybe you fought a civil war? with one of your paintings. Or maybe you just got back from New York City and I'm still feeling like a basket case. <laughs> still catching up. That's the worst part of travel is you get to go and hang out with magical art supplies that are in New York City, but then you come back to just this wall <laughs> of emails which is pretty much what I'm going through right now. But I hope some of you have gotten an opportunity to see some of the travels I've had going to various art supply stores. Kremer Pigment, Guerra Paint, which I have not posted stuff on yet. There's still quite a bit of that. And also the Complete Sculptor, which is an incredible art supply store that's in Manhattan. Let me bring up some of those videos so you guys can take a look. And look at this, we have a new channel banner. Did anybody notice? It's getting a little sick of the old one. And was trying to make one more fun. I have a Met selfie in there. I think I was in the Rubens room, but I was very proud of that selfie. And I think it's more fun. And it's always good to update things, get things a little more fresh. So tell me, in the chat, your questions. What would you like to pick my brain about? Because my goodness, there's a lot to talk about when you're an artist. And it's amazing how sometimes we produce these one minute videos and some of them are hyper specific. And I oftentimes say to myself, does anybody really care about this thing to the depth <laughs> that I do? And it's like, you guys do. And that's why you're the best audience because you guys really understand that these little little things about being an artist they actually matter so if some of you didn't have an opportunity because oh cool i'm so glad you like the complete sculptor videos they really could only exist in new york it's just so specialized and i spent so much time there so this is the visit. This is their marble and rock area, which I mean, I just look at those rocks and I'm like, who does this? Who transforms this into a sculpture? I mean, after you see something like this, you touch a piece of marble. You just cannot believe that people ever made anything out of these pieces of stone. So Amanda is asking, what was your favorite room at the Met? I think probably this is one of my favorite rooms. It's this huge sculpture hallway. And it has two of my favorite sculptures in there, Burgers of Calais by Rodin that you're seeing right now. And then the Carpeau sculpture, Ugolino and his sons. And it's just a beautiful sculpture gallery. There's lots of light, high ceilings. I, I always make sure every time I go to the Met, I always go to this room. The other rooms, yeah, it's okay if I skip it. But then the second best one, I guess if we want to talk about 2D, would probably be the Rembrandt room because oh, just being in a room with Rembrandt paintings. There are a lot of paintings that honestly, this is terrible for me to say, but I just don't think there's a big difference <laughs> between seeing them in real life and in the digital image. There is, I'm not saying there is not, but there are definitely some paintings where I see them in person and I'm like, oh yeah, that's what I thought it'd look like. But a Rembrandt painting, it is not what you could ever think it was like. You might think that you could 
think about what it is, but there's something about a Rembrandt painting that is so different. The, the luminosity, the glow that is coming off of those paintings. There's no painter who I think is like that in the way that Rembrandt is. So Sue Janice says, I feel we as artists want one medium to fulfill all of our artistic needs, but rarely happens. Each medium has a limit. Please comment. Example, gouache almost works like oils, but difficult to blend seamlessly. That's true. Different media can only do certain things, but I would like to flip it around and think about it from an angle that says, hey, what are the assets of this material? What is gouache really, really good at that no other material can do? Because I think the thing is, when we expect a material to behave a certain way, we want it to do this thing, that's usually when we get frustrated because it's sort of like my kids. <laughs> if I try to tell my kids to do something, they're teenagers now, it will not work. They have to decide on their own to do something. I could tell them all day, do this, this, and this, but they don't want to. <laughs> And that's the thing is, is you have to embrace the material for what it is. And when you think about it in terms of, oh, well, I can't do this. I can't do that. I can't do that. That's just a way to make the material feel really inflexible because you're trying to make it do something that is very difficult to do. Now, there are some people who do that, who use materials in a way where you are making it do something that it doesn't want to do, but they really are committed to that experience. So I don't think necessarily that people want one medium to fulfill all their artistic needs. I certainly don't. Gosh, I'd be miserable <laughs> if I wanted that to be the case. And so I would say that you probably don't want to expect one material to do that because I just don't think that's possible. There's so many media and they have so many different talents. By the way, we do have space. Oil Pastel Workshop, Saturday, March 23rd. We still have a few spots open. If you guys would like to register, you get to work with me in real time. It is really, really fun. Margaret says, thanks for clay reviews. I'm thinking of trying oil-based clay next, so I was glad to get that info. Well, we have more info in our website. There's a 3D area and half the tutorials in there are oil-based clay. And of course, if you guys are in our Discord, you can also ask us there as well for support because oil-based clay, it's fantastic for certain things. First of all, home studios, it's perfect. Because when I was in graduate school, we modeled these huge figures. And we did them with ceramic clay. But the issue with ceramic clay is you have to keep it wet. And it also creates a ton of dust everywhere. And so oil-based clay is just the greatest thing because you don't have to worry about it drying out and there's no dust. It's really quite a sweet deal. U11 is asking, how did Renaissance painters depict ancient Greek and Roman cultures? I would probably have to go back and look really carefully at some Renaissance paintings to give you a more concrete answer. But actually, a lot of it was that in the Renaissance, they were really obsessed with linear perspective. It was like this new toy. Like once they figured it out, they're like, oh my God, we have to put it in every painting. So you'll notice a lot of Renaissance paintings there's just so much linear perspective. You notice that it's not an accident that they were really into these checkerboard floors because that just really pushes that. And so oftentimes you will see ancient buildings placed in perspective in Renaissance paintings. That would be my guess. I'd have to, again, take a closer look at a specific painting to really get into that. Carolyn says, viewing works in person is so different from seeing them on a screen. You can really see the textures and the impact of the scale of the piece. And another thing, too, is when I was at the Met, 
Ugolino and his sons, it's an incredible composition in that it looks amazing from every single point of view. And not every sculpture is like that. There are some sculptures that are like, clearly this is the back. And the sculptor wasn't really that invested in that. But I find what happens a lot is these really famous sculptures, you don't get to see the back very often. So I made sure when I was looking at Rodin's Burgers of Calais, I took pictures of the feet. I took pictures of the back of it, which is not a very common we photographed point of view. And I did that too with Rodin's Hand of God. It's another marble sculpture. And so I do find that if, if you look up Michelangelo's David, it's almost all front shots. I mean, maybe there's a few of the back, but not that many. So for me, that's a very compelling reason to want to see sculpture in person. Pat says, love the tour of the sculpture supply store. There's a place like that just outside of Toronto that I love to visit, but it's a fraction of the size. I really could have spent five straight days in there shooting because the amount of things, oh my God, like the tools alone, <laughs> the tools were just out of control. Like I saw this one shelf, it was just like, packed with wood sculpture tools. It's like really amazing. Yeah, so Anna makes a good point here. Materials have their limits. You can push it, but not break them. It's like asking a dog to be a cat. Yes. And what I typically do is I try to identify what is the material that is the best suited for the thing I want to do. So that's another reason I don't just work in one material because I like having that opportunity to say, you know what, this really would not work well in oil pastel, but it would work really well in colored pencil. So for me, that versatility, having experience in different media is very, very helpful because then I have that option. Like if you only work in one material, then you can't really give yourself other ways of working. And Sonnet says, I'm working on a painting I started in Open Studio. Do you suggest blocking in the colors and values to start? The point of the painting is the light. So should I focus on that? Well, I'm so glad to hear that. In case some of you guys don't know what Sonnet is talking about, we have Open Studios Club, which is in the Discord. And by the way, everybody in the Discord gets one free session. Take us up on it. It's basically a free workshop in a way because you get to be with me live on voice. So Sonnet has attended a couple sessions and I've gotten to see the progression of Sonnet's painting, which is really, really fun. I would say Sonnet, you want to focus on the entire composition. So yes, the, the light in your painting, I remember it's coming from a window. That is certainly the main event in the painting that you're doing. But the thing is what makes the light work is the shadows. And so you need to have the shadows there when you put in the light because a lot of painting is about contrast. I was talking to somebody, we're doing a backgrounds workshop this Saturday about texture in a background. Really important to have that contrast. Like if you have a really smooth peach and it's next to a pineapple, you're going to see the difference, <laughs> like a pineapple so spiky. And so Sonnet, I would recommend really, really simple shapes. Very, very basic. It's going to look so basic that you're almost going to feel embarrassed. But paintings have to start that way. So here's the temptation right now, Sonnet, is that I know you've worked so hard on that piece, is to feel like, oh, well, shouldn't I be further along by now? Shouldn't it look better by now? Actually, no. <laughs> There's a very long period of the piece just looking super, super simple, which you have to be that way <laughs> with painting. Does anybody ever do that? Like you start the painting and you're like, oh, this just looks so dumb. But it's not because it's dumb. It's because it's just early in the process and that is totally okay. By the way, everybody, I would love to go to this huge printmaking conference in the US and I would love to share it with all of you. 
because as you all know, I'm a big printmaking nerd. And so this is a conference. It is hosted by the Southern Graphics Council. It's one of the biggest printmaking organizations in the US. And the conference, it's four days of everything you can think of for printmaking. All these print shops open. It's in Providence this year. And so I know RISD is hosting a bunch of things. There are artist talks. There are panel discussions. I know some of the libraries open up their collections. Sometimes they have books and stuff like that that have printmaking or their collections, museum talks. And oh my God, there's a materials fair. Just picture all of the specialized printmaking suppliers in one giant room and they all have a table and they all brought all their stuff and you get to walk around and just ah, touch all the burnishers and scrapers. So the first year that I went to this conference was in 2004. I was about to graduate graduate school. And I just went because my professor said, well, they have this open portfolio session and you know that would be really nice for you to go there. It was at Rutgers. And so I went there just thinking, oh, I'll go to this portfolio thing. And I had no idea what I was stepping into. So when I get there, I see the material. I'm like, what? Like, <laughs> I didn't know that they have that. And I actually didn't bring a lot of cash with me, which was not a problem because I probably would have just liquidated my bank account. But I bought a really nice burnisher there that I hadn't seen anywhere else. And so I would love to go and just film everything I encounter so you guys can have exposure to this. Because the thing about these conferences, they're expensive. This place, you have to buy membership, which is 75 the conference fee is 225 Of course, I have to pay for a plane to get out there, feed myself at the same time. And I just don't have the funding for that on my own. I wish I did, which is why if you want to help me get to this printmaking conference and give you access to all the stuff, which usually nobody gets to see outside of academia, I'll do it. But we need the funding. <laughs> so if you want to help out, there is a link in the video description below with all the information. Like I give you guys my budget and the breakdown and everything for how to get me there. I would so much love that because it, it really is a tragedy to me that these incredible demonstrations and artist talks and just nobody knows they're there except for the same, I don't know, 300 people that go every year. And it's just the coolest thing. Like they have all these demonstrations and yeah. Anyway, <laughs> help me get there because I want to share it with you guys. It really would be amazing content. It's also everything at the conference is like super, super specialized. So everything is just so niche and amazing. Kathy is asking, I paint watercolor and gouache, but I'm itching to try oil. Thinking about water soluble oil as a way to start without the solvents can I do without special ventilation? Yeah, water soluble oil paints is all water-based. So you don't have to use any solvent. Water-soluble oil paints, they do have mediums the same way you would with oil paint, but they are specially formulated for the water-soluble oils. So you can't take, let's say, linseed oil that you would be using for oil paint and put it in water-soluble oil paint. You have to make sure it's linseed oil that is specially formulated for water soluble oil paint. And so what I typically recommend to people is to stay within one manufacturer if you've never done it before. So for example, I was using Windsor Newton water soluble oils and I bought a bunch of their, well, I didn't because they sent it to me, but they had all these oil based mediums and thickeners and slow dry medium and stuff. And I use those. So you just have to make sure you don't mix them because they're not the same thing. But it's a good entry point. The only thing I would say, Kathy, and we have several tutorials on water soluble oils. I know a lot of people, number one, they're safer <laughs> in terms of ventilation, much, much better than oils. But I will say it's not that close to what oil painting is like. And a lot of people ask me, well, what's the comparison? 
And I almost feel like it's a different paint. It's just very different. And when I think about it in comparison to oils, it just feels inferior. So I think for me, a better way to think about it would be to say, oh, okay, water soluble oils is this type of paint. Oil paint is this type of paint. Because when I try to compare them, I just get a little upset. <laughs> but just type Art Prof water soluble into YouTube and you'll find it. You can do the same thing on artprof.org, our website. And let's see. Good point from Anna. Water soluble oils aren't real oil paints. They are just goopy. I don't know how they're actually made. I don't have the specifics of that, but they you're right. They really don't feel like oils to me. It, it's just, it's a different paint medium altogether. Dominion is asking, can digital prints be put in a museum? Oh yeah, absolutely. They can put anything <laughs> in a museum. And I think with AI coming up, MoMA had a huge AI installation in their lobby. There's just like huge screen. It's a giant wall. And I can't remember the artist's name, but the, the very harsh critics described it as looking like a fancy screensaver. But that was an AI piece and it was in MoMA. And so I don't think I would say that anything is really off limits for a museum in terms of materials unless it's a safety issue. I mean, I've seen all kinds of things. Be put. I, I've seen hunks of poo in there. I mean, there was an artist a long time ago, I think his thing was just this big mound of elephant dung or something like, I mean, people do all kinds of things in the museum. So yes, absolutely. And Thank you, Pat. So appreciate the support. Oh my gosh, I, I wish I could lead an art prof tour at that conference, but I know for a lot of people, they can't travel. I had somebody tell me I'm immunocompromised. I'm not able to travel to places like that. A lot of people can't afford it. I can't afford it. I think that's why I'm asking people to help me out because I can't afford to go. Amaris is asking, how can I improve my backgrounds and portrait drawings? I'm always studying and looking for new ways to experiment and practice. Just tired of my mom roasting me about my work and not looking great. I think that's really frustrating, Amaris. Because, okay, raise your hand. <laughs> Who here has gotten pressure from family, friend, just people in your life, whoever they are? Who think you're not doing enough or think you should paint this or think you shouldn't paint that or whatever it is. I just think people need to keep their opinions to themselves because to me, crit should be something you're asking for. I mean, if you come to me and say, well, can you help me with this portrait? What can I improve? Yes, I will do that. But I will never just go to a person and be like, you shouldn't do that or what, like even my kids who make art, I don't make comments about their stuff because I want them to just have it be what it is. And it works out better that way. <laughs> but yeah, I, I think it might be Amaris. I, I don't know the specifics of the situation, but you may have to just in one ear out the other because there really are certain people who are not good to talk to about your work. People who don't fundamentally understand why you do what you do. And it's just inevitably frustrating. I and mean, you can't do anything to change their minds, to educate them. I mean, maybe you could, but that takes a while. That's not something you can do immediately. So I think it's not that your work is bad. I think it's just, it's the wrong person to give you that information. But the main thing about backgrounds, because we have been talking about backgrounds quite a bit in the backgrounds workshop that we're doing tomorrow, is to ask yourself how that background can contribute to your story. So if you're doing a background and it's a portrait of a person, okay? Think about the places people inhabit and how much those places impact how we see or perceive somebody. 
So I've always thought it was very interesting because if you look at TV shows, think about the people that design those interiors, the people who have to buy the props. So for example, I'm actually watching The Sopranos right now. I know it's like 20 years later. <laughs> who here has seen The Sopranos? I, I'm surprised. It's really a great show. But when I think about the design of their house and what that house says about them is really a character study. I mean, if you think about people's childhood bedrooms, I mean, I was a angsty teenager. I had like cure posters all over. I mean, that, that was my world at that time. And so a space can say a lot about a person. Like you can look at my space. Maybe you never met me before, but you can say, okay, you're an artist. Yes, you don't know how to clean. And number three, what are you doing? Because your stuff is all over the place. Some other people might have an art studio that's very neat and that's more reflective of their personality or maybe their willingness to clean, which I don't have a lot of that. And some great suggestions in here about water soluble stuff. And we also have Deb Lee who says at the Met, my daughter and I got a lot of ideas for design from the South American Peruvian artifacts. That is wonderful, Deb, because I was just talking to somebody who I was doing an artist call with and they're designing these surrealistic looking phones is maybe <laughs> the best way I can put it. And we were talking about different things in history that they could look at for inspiration. So one thing I did bring up was masks because masks have such wonderful shapes in them, depending on the culture and time period. And so I was saying that the masks, if you just look at the shape, like just the shape of the face, some of the faces are like really, really skinny. You know, it's very different than a face that's very wide. So I'm so happy you did that because People need to look at art that's not on Instagram. Don't get me wrong. I, I am totally fine with people finding stuff on Instagram. It's just most people aren't seeing Peruvian artifacts on Instagram and they're harder to find. But you go into a museum and you, you just are met with things that you normally would not seek out because the algorithms are just showing you the same thing. I watch a bunch of beaver videos because I think they're cute and hardworking. And it just keeps showing me beaver videos. I never get exposed to anything else. But it occurred to me when I was at the Met, I, I just wandered into the armor section. I don't really think armor is that exciting for me. I mean, it's an incredible art form. I'm not saying it isn't. I'm just saying it's not like my favorite thing. I wouldn't take the initiative to like go out and find <laughs> armor. But because I was at the museum and I walked through that hallway, I did look at it the armor. And I just wish we had more opportunities like that. Oh, yes. Yeah, so some of you guys may have missed this moment. <laughs> In fact, I can pull up some of the images if you guys don't know what I'm talking about. So I, I had this whole plan that I was going to make this bust, which I will show to you guys right now. So this, this is the bust I made and I did document the entire process. So the portrait armature, actually <laughs> it's in my desk. Hang on a second. You guys have to see this. Here, here's the bust. This, this is what it looks like after you finish the cast. So this is, oh dear, I'm sorry, Aaron. This is the head. Do you see? This is the armature. And you can see this is the shirt, but the process of making a rubber mold, you end up destroying the sculpture because you have to take it. Oh, actually I have the mold behind me. Do you guys want to see the mold? It's right there. Hang on. <laughs> I just got to pick it up. This is the mold. I haven't filmed, I mean edited. I haven't edited the process yet but there's going to be a lot of videos on how I made this. Okay. So, so follow me. Okay. So this is some mold, right? That is the sculpture. So that sculpture was cast in liquid plastic. 
and you can see here if I take apart the mold and no, no confirmation yet, Pat. I hope so. So the whole plan was that I was going to ship him and I did ship him this sculpture and I would go to stage door and I would ask him, Aaron, did you get my sculpture? But they didn't do stage door the night I was there. It made me really, really sad, but I'm going to see him in May. So I'm going to see if they have stage door then and maybe I'll be able to ask him. But I was like, maybe he won't remember because it'll be too far from now. But I suspect that most people remember if they get sent a bloody head sculpture at some point. And actually, I didn't mean to put blood on his mouth. That was an accident. But I looked at I was like, oh, well, he's sort of a horrible person because he murders all these people. So even though somebody slit his neck at the end, maybe it makes sense for him to have blood on his mouth anyway. Plus, there was nothing I could do about it. I, this automotive paint, it was not going to come off. So yes, you can see that. This was really fun, though. I mean, it's a silly project, but I had a lot of fun with it because I thought, okay, well, I can do this, but I'm also going to produce these videos to show you guys that entire process beginning to end. So, okay, I'll show you guys the mold. It's so weird, really weird looking. Okay, so this, this is the mother mold. That's the plaster. So I put these rubber bands around it because you have to hold it in place and so if i take the rubber bands apart okay so watch this if this is the coolest thing so this is how you take it apart you do this okay so that is that is the mother mold made out of plaster so that is one side and then the other side this is the other mother mold Okay, so the mother mold holds the rubber mold in place because this thing is all floppy. And if I tried to cast this, it would just like mush everywhere. So basically the mother mold comes together and it holds the rubber in place so it doesn't move when you're casting. Okay, so these are the two halves of the mother mold. And then make sure I don't break this thing pretty fragile. What the heck? How does that work? Okay, there we go. Okay, now here is, here's the rubber mold. Isn't it weird? <laughs> and look at this. That's how it comes apart. Do you see that? So if you look real close, do, do you guys see his face? Here, I'll hold it like this. Do you guys see the face? Do you see the nose and the mouth and the two eyes? So in here is where I cast things. And then you can see this is all just the outside of the mold. So basically you take this and you pour the liquid plastic inside and then you take it apart and then you have this lovely bloody head. <laughs> I know it doesn't make any sense. I was trying to explain it to my kid and I thought, oh, if I have the mold, she'll understand. She didn't. <laughs> so I'm going to need to make those videos because mold making is just so weird. I'm like, how do people come up with this? It's like really, really bizarre. And let's see, Kathy, thank you so much for the super sticker. We so much appreciate that. Yeah, any super sticker, super chat you guys give us right now, it's going right to the printmaking conference trip. I'm really hoping I get enough to go because it, oh my God, I just, I keep drooling over the content that I could share with all of you by going there. All right, let's see. Thank you so much, Margaret. So much appreciate everybody's support. It means so much to us. I wish I were in a place where I never had to ask people to help us out, but we are not at that point yet. And yes, there's an armor section. It's like huge room, almost as big as that Rodan room. And it's all like life size. I mean, not like there's other <laughs> sizes of armor, but they had huge samurai things that, oh my God, it's like, you, I kind of can't believe that people spent so much time on the artistry 
of those are it's like they're going right into battle it's like no you're going to destroy <laughs> it's like beautiful handmade pieces of armor <laughs> lisa says wondering if his security flipped over the red blood i don't know i i did do it signature required i don't know if that makes a difference <laughs> I don't know. I'd like to get tackled at the stage door. <laughs> well, not by security. <laughs> and Jen says, I was afraid someone would be afraid due to the subject matter and misunderstand to get. I mean, it is Sweeney Todd. If you don't know that Sweeney Todd has a lot of blood in it, <laughs> like you obviously did not read the story. Real Deal says, used to work in special makeup effects, did a lot of sculpting and mold making. Oh my gosh, the stuff that I see people, you know how sometimes they do like behind the scenes for movies? I cannot believe the complexity of the molds that they make, especially when you're doing life casting. It's just a ton of work. And casting is one of those things. It's like it works or it doesn't. Like you can just lose the whole thing if you mess something up. Oh, so Susan, the mother mold is cast in plaster, but I actually apply the plaster with a knife. So when I release the video, you guys will see, it, it looks like I'm frosting a cake. It's basically, it's not poured. And I know a lot of the times that's how people use plaster, but I have this wonderful friend who taught me this amazing plaster technique that works incredibly well. So I'm going to cut a reel that shows you guys that process. Kathy's asking, are you going to cast more copies of this one? It's kind of like a 3D print. Yeah, it is. The only problem, oh God, you guys, so embarrassing. So when I made the cast, I was like, oh, everything's going along. Okay. <laughs> and then I take it apart and I go to put it together to pour the rest of the month, the rubber. I missed this one step one one stupid step i can't even tell you what it is because it won't make sense but it's a step that takes one second and i didn't do it and so the consequence of that is i have a hole in the rubber which is very bad so i think what i'd have to do first is repair the ru rubber mold see if i can get it to work because the other issue i had is that it did leak when i cast it the good thing is that the liquid plastic it sets really fast it sets you have basically three minutes to stir it before it hardens. And so luckily it did harden in time to like plug the leak, but I really need to fix that rubber mold. But yes, in theory, I could make 50 bloody heads if I wanted to. I mean, of course the blood would be different on every single one, but yeah, I totally could. I want to, and I want to try some other materials I use that liquid plastic because I've used it a lot in the past. I didn't want to try something new, but you guys probably saw at the Complete Sculptor video that they have all these samples. It's amazing. So you can go and like touch a cast sample of each of the resins and they have epoxy. Oh, super, super fun. Oh, the trip, if I get to go, will be in early April. So I will spend some time on the East Coast. It's four days. So I'll just be like shut inside a convention. <laughs> or I'm sure there's going to be museums and stuff to go to. But yeah, it's pretty intense. It's a lot. And they also have evening things and everything. So I'll be there at the conference for a solid four days. And you guys probably know that Kat, Dorian, and Mia all live in Rhode Island. And lots of my other artist friends. So hoping to do more studio visits as well. And Susan's asking, have you tried dental stone? I have not, but you guys know what I picked up? I picked up a set of dental carving tools at the Complete Sculptor. And you know what I did? I, I went to the Complete Sculptor first, and then I was going to go to the Met. And I had these in my bag. I was like, oh my God, are they going to take this away? Because the museum security has gotten to be really uh, comprehensive. When I went to MoMA 
like I had a whole thing, like they were like doing that thing around your body and everything. And actually it made me wonder if they've pumped up the security because of those climate protest things. I, I mean, I have to imagine from a security point of view for a museum, it must be incredibly stressful. And let's see, we also have Real Deal says developed a latex allergy from looking from latex ultimately caused a lot of food allergies to plant foods. I recommend using silicone. I thought rubber and silicone were sort of interchangeable as a word, although I don't know. I love silicone because silicone to me is like a miracle. It's like it doesn't stick to anything. There are certain molds where you have to apply something called a release agent. So that's to make sure that the, the mold actually pulls away from the cast. Some things, if you don't do the release agent, it's not going to work. But silicone, like I just don't use the release agent. There's no point. It doesn't stick to anything. It's it's really a miracle. Anna's asking, are you coming back to New York? I will at some point for sure, but not for a little while because hopefully I'm gonna go to this printmaking conference. And then in May, I'm very excited. I'm going to LA. So I get to see Jordan. And it occurred to me, I was like, I've never been to any of the California museums. Like I haven't been to the Getty. I haven't been to San Francisco MoMA. So I definitely want to do that. And oh, too bad, Aaron Tveit has a concert in LA. <laughs> I'm just going to follow him around the world. And then in June, I have a very special trip planned. And I'm not going to reveal anything about it right now, but it's going to get amazing footage that I'm... Oh, so, so thrilled about. Carolyn says, if you go to the conference, will you have a meetup in the area? Oh, that's really smart. Yeah, actually, I did talk to somebody, messaged me on Instagram, and they were like, oh, I really hope you can come and I can meet you and everything. Yeah, the best thing about that conference is that I, I hate making small talk and I hate being put on the spot to do social things. But in printmaking, in the it's so tiny and so specialized that you can strike up a conversation with anybody in like two seconds. It's really, really nice. It's not a lot of places that I feel I could do that. But I remember the first time I went, I was like, wow, I can, I can talk to these people. <laughs> like It's actually really easy to talk to everybody. But yeah, I mean, I've done things where we'll just have like a lunch meetup or something because or dinner meetup or something. So yeah, I'll see if I can do it. But first I have to get to the conference. <laughs> Let's do that first. Susan saying, are you ever coming to Florida? You know something? Somebody in a workshop from, I think it was two weeks ago, they did a, I think it was DJ in the Discord. I think, I could be wrong. But they did a watercolor painting of the Everglades in Florida. And I've never seen the Everglades before. And I was just blown away by how strange the shapes were. Like, I'd never really seen trees like that. But yeah, if anybody wants to fly me anywhere in the world, I will show up because I've got the travel bug. And I love showing up in some country, some city, and there's like 20 people there who want to see me. <laughs> it's the coolest thing. I mean, there's a whole bunch of you guys who I have seen in person for that reason. Oh my gosh, Jen, San Francisco. <laughs> my San Francisco story is that I was there for a wedding. So I was only there for like the weekend. We went to this restaurant. I can't remember what it was called, but it was basically, <laughs> the best way I could describe it, Indian food on pizza. And we took a red eye back and Oh, I, ugh, I've never thrown up on a plate before. And that was my first time. It was really bad. But yeah, I'm imagining, you know, in LA, I'd like to do a meetup too, because Jordan will be there and that's a bigger city. And so hopefully we could get some people in there. Hello, Arknark. Just want to say, I think you're super rad. Oh, good. Because my kids don't. <laughs> my kid actually said to me, you make life so boring. I'm like, okay, thanks. Thank goodness most people don't think that about me. <laughs> oh, thank you, Susan. Yeah, I had a lot of people who showed me around when I went to Portugal. 
I had people who drove me around town and everything. I mean, to me, that's the best way to visit a city is to go with somebody who actually knows the place. I think it was Mariana who we did a studio visit with in Lisbon, Portugal. And she showed us this amazing view that was at the top. It was like this cafe at the top of this department store. And she said, nobody knows it's there unless you're a local. And I was like, okay, this is the type of thing <laughs> that I want to do for sure. <laughs> and I know, like, I would think I would have liked it. I like both. I don't know why it just didn't sit well with my stomach that day. So maybe I need to try it again at some point. And Alexander is asking, I bought my first Windsor Newton acrylics. Are they good? It's just for a tea tray, but I normally just use Apple Barrel. What kind did you buy, Alexander? Is it the Winton brand that they have? So Winton is the student grade paint of Windsor Newton, but they also have professional grade acrylics. Come to think of it, I don't think I've really used their acrylics that much. Yeah, not at all. I guess because I like to use Golden a lot. And also this place, what's their name? Sennelier. Okay. They sent me an absurd amount of acrylic paint. And so I always feel like I have to use that <laughs> because it's there. But you guys should wait and see. I went to Guerra Paint in Brooklyn, New York, where it's basically customize your own paint. I mean, I know we talk about art supply stores as candy stores, but this is literally make your own ice cream sundae, but with paint. And I spent a lot of time there with the owner, Saren, who is lovely and so nice and generous. And she showed me all kinds of things. I mean, each of these art supply stores, I probably could have spent four days there. I mean, I felt like I only saw about 25% of what they had. And I just didn't even know that was possible. So one thing I did was I said to Sarah, okay, well, since we can customize something for me, maybe I should tell you what are some of the things that I wish my paints did. And so the first one was that I'm always looking for an opaque white. And I found it, actually I have it right here. <laughs> this is perfect. So I have this white 2.0 by Stuart Semple and it's very opaque, but it's a little runny. It's a little runnier than I'd like it to be. And I would love to have a white that is this opaque, but is denser in pigment and not so runny. And so she was giving me some options and she did give me, did I leave it here? Let me see if I can find it. I still haven't unpacked my suitcase it's right here. Oh, I found it. Oh, cool. Okay. <laughs> wow, everything's just like <laughs> in arm's reach. Okay, so let me show you guys this. So. She gave me this. Okay, so this is a tiny bottle of titanium white and it's very high in pigment. So it's it's actually heavy. I know it looks like a tiny little bottle, but it, it weighs a lot. And she said the reason why is because it has a lot of pigment in it. And she had some other jars of this, which is like high pigment and they were so heavy. Like I, I'd never held something that heavy before that was a bottle of paint. And she also gave me this. And I'm going to have a couple other things later. Look at this thing. Has anybody heard of this? This is called Aquazole. And you can see here, it says high performance water soluble polymer. And I guess this is used a lot in watercolor paints. And so she said they're, they're crystals. So if you hear that, let's see if I can open it. Oh, there it is. Okay. So I don't know if you guys can see very well, but those are the crystals. Maybe I can pick some up for you guys to see. So these crystals, but what you do is you melt it in water. So it almost becomes like a matte medium that you make yourself. Because I told Saren that I really liked thin glazes. And so she was like, oh, you might like this one. And then they have, oh my God, just... <laughs> shelves of glittery shiny things so if you guys don't know i'll type it into the chat guerra paint and pigment they are also on instagram 
And certainly you can order off their website, but it's so fun to go to the store. And if you can't go, you can live vicariously through our reels because, oh my God, I was like hyperventilating. <laughs> and Anna's asking, could you go to the conference for a day? I think I might be going if I could take the bus there. I don't think they have day rates. You'll have to look it up, but that's not typical for a conference. Usually you just have to get the whole conference package, but look into it. I don't know what they have. Yes, it's like Cold Stone Creamery. For pain. It's better than that. Like you guys have no idea. Okay, I better cut some reels this weekend because I keep telling everybody about it and I haven't cut the reels yet. Yeah, so AA, you can put in, pick your binder, pick your pigment, and so many additives. There's like thickeners, there's stuff that makes your paint like a 3D sculpture. I mean, you guys are going to flip when I show you this stuff. So I don't think, I don't think the crystal is binder. I think this is... I mean, I so do not have the terminology correct. You'll have to listen to what the owner says because she's the really the one that knows. This just says water soluble polymer. So I don't think this is the binder. Again, I could be wrong. I haven't opened it up yet. But um, when you guys have questions about it that comes out, you know, I'll, I'll let Guerra know. And if you just tag them and stuff, I'm sure they'd be happy to help you. Oh, I like what Carolyn here is saying. Compounds are made with heavy metals are always surprising. The bottles in the lab with lead compounds in them are shockingly heavy when you pick them up. Oh, that's really cool. I know. I really felt when I went to their store, I mean, it was like entering a science lab and they had this incredible wall that was just huge color chart with swatches. And oh my God, I could go on and on and on. Yeah, so I'm really hoping <laughs> that you guys can live vicariously through that because I don't know, I think that's a lot of what social media is for a lot of people is to see things you normally would not get to see. And hopefully it's with somebody whose commentary you like. I mean, me and DP had such a great time at MoMA. We have many more videos coming out. Art Fossil says, I was doing art history research one day. I found a fresco-like process that used to paint made of glass. Anyone else know what I'm talking about by chance? Paint made of glass? Nothing comes to mind. Are you saying it was fresco or it was like, I mean, it's fresco-like process? Yeah, I'm not really sure. I guess I'd need more information, Art, to know exactly what you're referring to. So yeah, sorry, I don't have an answer. Okay, thank you. <laughs> Blue Ren did the research for us. The Aquazole is a binder that can be used to make watercolor and gouache, according to Guerra Paints website. Okay, so it is a binder. Okay, don't listen to me. Go to the Guerra website and you guys will figure out <laughs> what everything is. Oh, you should go, Sarah, because the other thing is I talked to them about they do demos for everybody. So they don't pick people to do demos for. Like you just walk in and they'll give you a demo. It's amazing. But I was explaining to them that actually what they do, a lot of it is educational because, well, yes, I mean, they're a company that sells all these supplies. I learned so much just spending that day, like the way she described all of the elements and the interactions between pigments and certain binders. I mean, I really felt like I was getting a crash course in how paints are assembled. And the company was actually started by Guerra, Art Guerra. He passed away, but now Saren runs it. And I believe um, Saren's partner makes the paint, which I couldn't see because, you know, industry secrets and stuff like that. And, okay, so wish you had more information, art, so long ago. Yeah, sorry, it's hard to tell because there's just so many ways <laughs> to paint and it's hard to know exactly how to find things. Well, okay, but 
in Guerra's website, they had glass beads. And the thing is, some of the glass beads, I mean, they look like glass beads, regular ones. But then they have glass beads and they're ground up super fine. I mean, like they look like sand. And so they had glass beads that were various sizes going all the way down to being very fine. And so I've never done that before. I don't really know what that's like. But they had pumice rocks, all kinds of amazing additives. I mean, I'm not somebody who paints three-dimensionally at all. But going to that store, I was like, hmm, I need to find a reason to use all this stuff. Because Lauren had done that painting that was geese eating peas. And the peas had this beautiful luminosity. And they were glass beads, basically. What I think they were. I could be wrong. But they were definitely some additives that Guerra that she had bought at Guerra. So yeah. And they're big painting nerds there. It's run by artists. It's it's very different than when you walk into like a big corporate company type of thing. Not going to mention the name. <laughs> oh, duh. Thank you, Susan. <laughs> it's actually made of sand. Oh, you guys see how much I know about painting. Oh, Alexander says, I've seen interference watercolors that use crushed glass. It is truly breathtaking in effect. Actually, I confess, I never understood what interference colors were, but I think I get it now because she explained it to me at the shop. They have a million color charts and I think I get it, but ugh, I don't know. My brain just doesn't work that way. Has anybody here heard of interference paint? I didn't know about it at all until Lauren told me, and even that I didn't really understand, I guess I should just get some and see how it functions because there's some, I guess similarities with pearlescent paint because pearlescent paint does look different depending on the angle. But I think with interference paint, like it really changes colors. Like pearlescent, sometimes it just gets like brighter or shinier, but the interference, like this red would just like turn into green. It was crazy looking. Oh, so Alexander says, I use them as a final glaze for shimmery color change. Oh, man. <laughs> too many art supplies in the world. Okay, everybody, we got a few minutes left. Name in the chat some yummy art supply that you've been eyeing but haven't been able to bring yourself to buy because it was like too expensive or felt too self-indulgent or whatever. I mean, maybe I would just say I just buy out the full catalog of rubber <laughs> from the complete sculptor. Or I'd actually like to try casting in foam. So many weird, foam, like you mix them and you pour them and they go, Bleh, and I don't know what I would do with foam. I can't imagine a foam project for myself, but I just would like to try every single thing that you can cast because they have a lot of resins that are translucent and they also have some that are softer. And actually I've never mixed epoxy before. So they have liquid epoxy that you can mix and then cast. And some of them look like glass, like they're so clear and easy to see through. Gouache. Oh, I've never tried Holbein's gouache. I really don't have a lot of experience with gouache. Actually, the material that I really want to try next is probably flash paint. Has anybody here heard of flash paint? It's F-A-F-A-F-L-A-S-H-E. And I've heard that it's, I don't know, it sort of sounds like something I would want. I, I still don't totally understand what flash paint is, but I'm noticing that I do better with sort of like flatter paint, but not like gouache. Like gouache isn't really my cup of tea, but I, I've really been eyeing those flash paints because I'm, I'm just so curious how they function. Oh, Pat, a printmaking press. That is so worth it because once you have a little printing press, I mean, you don't have to print big to make wonderful prints. And I think you would love that. Ooh, schminke gouache, says Sarah. Seven angelic liquid graphite. All right. And Wing Canvas says Rembrandt special effects paints. I've never heard of those before. Oh, thank you, Blue Wren. <laughs> you got all the answers. 
flash paint is a vinyl paint that dries completely matte. That was it. That was the thing about flash paint that interested me was that it dries totally matte. Can be mixed with any acrylic mediums. Yeah, I don't know. I have to do my research on it. And by the way, you guys, if you have an art supply and you do want me to test it, you can send me art supplies. If you just type art supplies, ugh, what was the name of the page? I'll have to remember what that is, but we do have an Amazon wish list. Oh, it's called Art Supply Reactions. Okay, so if you guys go to our website and you just type into the search bar Art Supply Reactions, you will see that we do have a structured way that you can send us art supplies. For example, I have a wish list. And so you can just look at the wish list and send me whatever. Or if you have a suggestion like, oh, you want to see me try this, you can just tell me in the Discord on social media and I can add it to my wish list because some lovely people have already sent me some really, really cool things. And I'm always game for more art supplies. So you guys can always send that out if that is something you are curious about because we'll never ever get tired of that ever okay everybody join our patreon group we have weekly voice sessions with staff critiques from me and most of all a small group of artists visit artprof.org we have so much content on there that's not on youtube we have services like artist calls, statement editing, portfolio critiques, and you can also sponsor a video. So if you want me to make a video about a particular art supply, about a particular topic, you can sponsor that video and we will make it for you. No Discord chat after Friday night hangouts, but there will be one on the Sunday stream. Gosh, I should figure out what I'm doing. Oh, the Sunday stream. Oh, it's not an art long. It's with my art director, Ashley. And she is doing a Q&A on art directing. And so this, this is a great way you're going to get insider info. A lot of that content is not available online. So that's going to be a really fun stream. Those of you guys who have interest in that. Or I just told you about the Patreon group. Okay, sorry. <laughs> All these slides. I have too many slides in here. Big thank you to our top Patreon supporters who keep the lights on. You guys are critical to our budget. We would not be here without you. Art Prof has a podcast. It's available on Spotify and also on iTunes. And subscribe to our channel for more tutorials, critiques, and business tips. Everybody, thank you so much for watching. I'll see you next time. Bye.